In our last lecture, we talked about meiosis, the process by which cells make haploid gametes, or in humans that would be our sperm and egg cells, for the purposes of sexual reproduction. So before we move on and finish talking about that, I wanted to take a moment and compare mitosis and meiosis so that you could sort of visualize them side by side before we finish up. So this is a cell with a diploid number of four. Now, if this was us, there would be 46 chromosomes in here. So 2n means diploid. It means that the chromosomes have a partner. And I tried to draw them. This would be one pair of chromosomes, and this would be the second pair. So there's a pair of big chromosomes and a pair of little chromosomes. Now, this cell, whether it was going to go through mitosis or meiosis, the first thing that would happen is in the cell cycle, it would go through S, synthesis. And the chromosomes would duplicate. It doesn't mean that you'd make more chromosomes. It means that each chromosome would now consist of two chromatids. So this had four, this still has four, and I have two separate pairs. And they would not be lined up so pretty. Now, here's the difference if this cell is going to go into mitosis versus meiosis. So if the cell is going to go into mitosis for the purpose of making body cells, somatic cells, the first thing that's going to happen, prophase, the nucleus is going to disappear, and then the chromosomes are going to line up down the middle like this. Now I kind of drew them all the same size. I should have drawn them two different sizes, but it's all right. The spindle fibers would be attached. The chromosomes in anaphase then would split apart. And at the end, so this would be metaphase. And at the end, after telophase, each new cell with its new nucleus and all of that would end up with the same four chromosomes as the original. So we'd have two big ones and two little ones. And in here, two big ones and two little ones. And these would be identical to each other. And they would also be identical to the original cell at G1. So the daughter cells would still be diploid. They'd still have two copies of each chromosome and they would be identical to the original cell. All right, now meiosis. A little more complicated. Remember, the whole idea of meiosis is that we need to cut the chromosome number in half because when the sperm and the egg fertilize, each one is going to contribute to the offspring, and we'll get back our diploid number in humans, 46. Okay, so step one, meiosis one. The chromosomes would line up during beta, it would actually be called metaphase one. They would line up with their partners. So the two big ones would line up side by side. The two little ones would line up side by side. Spindle fibers would attach like this, not pulling apart the chromatids, but pulling apart the partners. So at the end of meiosis one, the cell would look like this. One big one, one little one. One big one, one little one. We started with four. The cell was diploid. And now each cell only has two. It is in or haploid. So if this was a human, we would these would line up in 23 pairs. So you'd literally have 23 side-by-side -side partners, so 46 total. And then in each of these cells, you'd have 23. Now, there's a second step, meiosis 2. But the thing about meiosis 2 is that it does not change the number of chromosomes in the cell. Well, why not? Because, remember, this, these chromosomes have two chromatids still. So in meiosis 2, they're going to line up identical to like what it looks like here. So this is technically metaphase of meiosis 2. They line up in a straight line. The chromatids are going to separate this time. So now what's going to happen is in each of these four daughter cells, sorry, we're going to have, I'll switch back to red, one big red one, one little one, one big one, one little one, one big one, one little one, one big one, one little one. So all that's happened here are the X's split, the chromatids split. So we end up with a total of four cells. They are not identical to the parent. They are haploid. They have half the chromosome number of the parent. And all of these, each of these could become then a sperm that could fertilize an egg. Now 
here's the thing. Based on this picture, it looks like even though these four cells are not identical to the parent, it looks like they're identical to each other. But they're actually not. And the reason why is because, remember, your chromosomes are in homologous pairs. So chromosome number one, these two chromosomes, they sort of match each other. Homologous means they carry information about the same thing. So they're the same size. If you were to look at the band pattern on them in a karyotype, which we're going to do in the lab, that would be the same. And let's just say that blood type was, was carried on chromosome number one. It's not, but let's just say it was. Then that would mean that you would have the code for blood type here on chromosome number one. And you'd also have the, clo the co sorry, the, the, um, the gene, sorry, for blood type on this chromosome number one. Now, are they identical to each other? Not necessarily, because you got one of these from your mom and one from your dad. And this is where genetics is going to come in and dominant and recessive. So, for example, um, if somebody was heterozygous for blood type, they could have one chromosome that codes for blood type A, and their other chromosome codes for blood type O. Now, since A is dominant, we haven't talked about that yet, if I was to do a test of their blood, I would find out that they're A. But every time this person makes a sperm or egg, they might give the chromosome that codes for A, or they might give the chromosome that codes for O. So they can have babies with different blood types, depending on the other parent. So it's random which one of these two chromosomes is going to get passed on every single time sperm and eggs are made. And these two chromosomes are homologous, meaning they carry information about the same traits, but they're not identical. They don't necessarily carry the same information about those traits. So you could have one chromosome that codes for you having freckles, and your other chromosome codes for you not having freckles. Will you have freckles? Well, it turns out freckles are dominant, so you would. Um, you could have one chromosome that codes for brown eyes and another chromosome that codes for blue eyes. What color will your eyes be? They'll be brown because brown is dominant. So these chromosomes have hundreds of genes, hundreds of traits, and the traits on, on chromosome 1 are always the same traits, but the actual codes may vary. So it may code for a different color hair or a different color eyes or a different blood type, etc. Okay, so um, moving on, that was just sort of a quick preview. So to wrap this up, this is just explaining that each chromosome lines up randomly, each pair, compared to every other pair. And I'll show you that in the picture. I was just discussing that. And depending on the other parent, it's also randomly fertilized. So every time an egg gets fertilized, you have a different sperm, a different egg with a different combination. And so no two offspring are going to be identical to each other. Um, this checkpoint question, we didn't really talk about this in detail. Uh, there is actually a formula to calculate this. If the diploid number is 10, um, not on a test or anything, but actually the formula is 2 to the n, where n is the haploid number. So if the diploid number is 10, the haploid number would be 5, and the number of possible gametes would be 2 to the 5th, which I believe is 32. But this is not on a test or anything, so don't worry about it. This is something that we learn in AP. I'm not sure why this question is in your lecture. So here's what it's showing. Here's what they mean. So again, imagine this chromosome codes for brown hair, and this chromosome codes for brown eyes. And let's say this one codes for blonde hair and blue eyes, because maybe you got one from your mom and one from your dad that coded for different things. What they're saying is, every single time you were to make a sperm or an egg, you might give a different combination. So this particular sperm carries the gene for both brown hair and brown eyes. This one carries blonde hair and blue eyes. Or what if they line up like this? Because it's random which chromosome's on the left or the right. Well, now this one codes for brown hair, but it codes for blue eyes, a totally different combination. And this is why you might have, say, three or four children in a family, and they have different hair colors, different eye colors, even different blood types, because the combination each time is completely random of what each parent gives. And then this is going to get fertilized. Remember, if this is a sperm, it's going to fertilize an egg that also has a random combination. In fact, the number of combinations in a gamete for you is 2 to the 23rd. So millions of combination possible, combinations possible. All right.
Um, the last little section here is about something called crossing over. So it turns out that during meiosis one, specifically during prophase one, the chromosomes don't just line up side by side. They line up so close that they're basically attached to each other. So if you imagine these two chromosomes and they are literally wrapped around each other, they, there's actually this lattice that attaches them to each other. And then, believe it or not, crazy thing happens, they can randomly have pieces swap places. So you can end up with this, where this chromosome now has a piece of the blue chromosome attached, and the blue one has a piece of the red. Now these are homologous chromosomes, so this is not going to cause a mutation or anything, but if before this chromosome carried, let's say, uh, brown hair and brown eyes, now this chromatid carries brown hair with blue eyes because this little gene swapped places between the two chromosomes. So this is called crossing over. It's between two chromatids on homologous chromosomes, matching chromosomes, but not between the chromatids in a single chromosome. It would not make a difference if pieces of this side swapped with this side because they're identical to each other before meiosis happens. But if the piece here swaps with the piece here, you could get a different combination. And this is, we're going to come back to this in genetics, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But they're showing two different genes, and if crossing over were to happen, you could get um, the capital um, C with the lowercase e on the same chromosome. It's kind of complicated. Um, we'll get to it in genetics. This is what crossing over actually looks like under an electron microscope. So it's actually called a chiasma, and it can cross over at both ends. Three to four crossovers, I believe, happen for every chromosome every time you reproduce. So it's not just two to the 23rd power, different kinds of eggs and sperm you can make each time. Uh, it's more than that because you don't know how much of the chromosomes are going to swap places with each other. So every chromosome is completely unique. Um, and this is just saying if you were to examine a chromosome from a gamete, a sperm or an egg cell, would it look exactly the same as a chromosome from a skin cell? And the answer is no, because this chromosome from a skin cell, let's say in G1, might look like this. But the chromosome in the gamete, because crossing over has happened, might look like this. It might have a, a piece of the other chromosome in that spot. So in G1, um, in a gamete, because of crossing over, the, the chromosome may now have swapped some information with its partner and look a little different. And this is sort of an overview of meiosis. So here's your crossing over. Notice here, this is meiosis one. They line up side by side at metaphase. Here, um, they split in half. And then um, it splits again. And each chromosome here only has one copy um, of the information. All right. Quick summary, how many times does the chromosome duplicate, meaning we go from a stick to an X? One time in both. How many cell divisions? Well, mitosis, it divides once and makes two daughter cells. And meiosis, it divides twice and makes four daughter cells. Chromosome number in the daughter cell is diploid. In the daughter cell here, the chromosome number is haploid, meaning it's half the original parent. How do they line up during metaphase? In, in um, mitosis, it's in a straight line. In meiosis, at least in meiosis 1, they line up side by side. In meiosis 2, they actually do line up in a straight line. But here's the big part that's different is meiosis 1. In metaphase, they line up with their partner and the partner's switch. Uh, genetic relationship, again, this is sort of like the number of chromosomes. Um, it's identical in mitosis. They're different because they only have half the genetic information in meiosis. And then the jobs, mitosis, this is for repair, this is for growth, like your skin cells, your bone cells, and this is specifically only for making gametes, for making sex cells that will be used for sexual reproduction. So that's sort of a summary of both processes. Tomorrow we're going to jump into mistakes. What happens when the chromosome numbers change, and how do they change? How does that happen? So that's tomorrow.